Perfect. So welcome everyone. As with every Zoom call, I'm going to apologize in advance if you see a little blonde-headed kid. Well, not so blonde-headed anymore. He had his head shaved last night. So <laughs> hat-headed kid running in behind and interrupting me. Hopefully he won't, um, but I uh, apologize in advance for that. So Welcome to um, a little bit of an update, I guess, or review on um, what we term as REDS, relative energy deficiency in sport. Um, a bit of a review as to kind of what it is. Um, I've got a couple of videos to share. And then moving into kind of how we've advanced over the last six years, because really REDS became kind of a, a known um, uh, syndrome, I guess, um, within sport, probably around 2014, the first paper by Mountjoy came out. And then since then, we've had a couple updates, and now really just moving into education in terms of, you know, coaches and athletes as to really what this is, because we're finding there's a lot more prevalence of REDS, and it goes undiagnosed most times um, in sport. So, this was actually scheduled as a coaches symposium. I think it was back in February um, and it was going to be a two hour session. So it is quite long. So I just kind of mentioned to Christy before, um, not that we have unlimited time now that we're working from home. I want to appreciate everybody's time. So I may stop at an hour, um, just again, being cognizant of everyone's other <laughs> responsibilities. Um, and we'll pick up as part two because it is, um, it, it's quite detailed. I've got lots of resources to show. Um, and then we can reschedule the second part with Christy, um, maybe next week it looks like we're going to be doing this for another few weeks so um, I'm sure we'll be able to, to fit that in so I just want to preface that before we start um, so acknowledgments um, go out to a couple of my cops and network um, dietitians who have done some presentations so there's their acknowledgments there um, and then the British Journal of Sports Medicine had an update literally just in January on just this topic so um, is it you know we're at a time um, Sorry, I didn't know that was going to happen. Did I lose you guys? Can you still see my screen? Okay. Yeah, you can I can't see your screen. And you. Okay, one sec. I just, it's because a call came in on my phone and then I lost um, everybody. One sec. Okay. And then you're still seeing my presentation. I'm not weird. Okay, there we go. I'm back. So, um, yeah, so it's a time for what we're saying, a revolution in sport culture. And we'll talk about um, that in terms of what, how we recognize some of the um, signs and symptoms, um, what to do in the event that you suspect um, an athlete having a reds and being it a more, I guess, open um, opportunity to engage with either IST or other health um, professionals if you suspect that, um, that you have an athlete or athletes um, that uh, might have um, relative energy deficiency. So a quick, um, I'm gonna stop, I think I have to stop sharing. I want to, oh, maybe I can go right to it from here, let's see. So I want to share an athlete's story. I might have to go to, here we go. So share, here we go. There, now you're seeing something different, hopefully. And some of you might've already seen this before. I'm not gonna play. Oh. 
It's going to be one of those days with technical difficulties. <laughs> Come on, I'm on Google Chrome. Apparently that works better. Oh, there we go. We also, if there's sound, we can't hear it right now. Oh. Mm -hmm. There is sound. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Okay, I'm going to stop it. There's no way to get the sound, hey? No. Is it playing from your phone or from your laptop or? Laptop. Okay. Um, and when you click the volume button, does anything come up like right next to? Um, no. New audio, audio settings. Anyway. Yeah. Are your earphones connected to the device? They are. Should they okay. not be? <laughs> Got it. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> okay. Let's try this. This is what happened to me. Yeah. Can you hear now? Yeah. Awesome. And when I first arrived, an all male Nike staff became convinced that in order for me to get better, I had to become thinner and thinner and thinner. This Nike team was the top running program in the country. And yet we had no certified sports psychologist. There was no certified nutritionist. It was really just a bunch of people who were Alberto's friends. So when I went to anybody for help, they would always just tell me the same thing. And that was to listen to Alberto. Alberto was constantly trying to get me to lose weight. He created an arbitrary number of 114 pounds and he would usually weigh me in front of my teammates and publicly shame me if I wasn't hitting weight. He wanted to give me birth control pills and diuretics to lose weight, the latter of which isn't allowed in track and field. I ran terrible during this time, but reached a point where I was on the starting line and I'd lost the race before I started because in my head, all I was thinking of was not the time I was trying to hit, but the number on the scale I saw earlier that day. It would be naive to not acknowledge the fact that weight is important in sports. It's like boxers need to maintain a certain weight or, you know, everybody always ends up citing the math about how the thinner you are, the faster you're gonna run because you have to carry less weight. But here's a biology lesson I learned the hard way. When young women are forced to push themselves beyond what they're capable at their given age, they're at risk for developing REDS. Suddenly, you realize you've lost your period for a couple of months. Then a couple of months becomes a couple of years. And in my case, it was a total of three. And if you're not getting your period, you're not going to be able to have the necessary levels of estrogen to maintain strong bone health. And in my case, I broke five different bones. The New York Times Magazine published a story about how Alberta was training me and nurturing my talent. We weren't doing any of that. I felt so scared, I felt so alone, and I felt so trapped. And I started to have suicidal thoughts. Um, I started to cut myself. Some people saw me cutting myself. And, uh, <laughs> sorry, um, nobody really did anything or said anything. Um, So in 2015, I ran this race and I, I didn't run super well. And afterwards, there was a thunderstorm going on. Half the track was under one tent. Um, Alberta yelled at me in front of everybody else at the meet. And he told me that I clearly gained five pounds before the race. Um, it was also that night that I told Alberto and our sports psych that I was cutting myself. And they pretty much told me they just wanted to go to bed. And I think for me, that was my kick in the head where I was like, this system is sick. I think even for my parents in certain ways, once I finally vocalized to them, I mean, they were horrified. 
they bought me the first plane ride home. And they were like, get on that flight, get the hell out of there. I wasn't even trying to make the Olympics anymore. I was just trying to survive. So I made the painful choice and I quit the team. After a multi-year investigation, the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency has banned Alberto Salazar from the sport for four years. Nike will shut down the Oregon Project. Nike CEO Mark Parker stepping down from the company in January of 2020. Those reforms are mostly a direct result of the doping scandal. They're not acknowledging the fact that there's a systemic crisis in women's sports and at Nike, in which young girls' bodies are being ruined by an emotionally and physically abusive system. That's what needs to change. Here's how we can do it. First, Nike needs to change. In track and field, Nike is all powerful. They can pull the top coaches. So I think I'm gonna stop there. Um, it does get into um, some other interesting topics, but uh, for the purpose of our um, session, I think uh, I'll just leave it there. Um, and if I can share again, back to here. Okay. So yeah, I mean, that's one of many stories. Um, you may have some in your own um, practical experiences or um, uh, she related to one specific piece of um, REDS that is a critical um, symptom that we see when, uh, when REDS um, is evident or is present. So there are many others and we'll look at those in a sec. Um, in this case, there was a definite eating disorder. Again, there doesn't have to be a specific eating disorder, a clinical, clinically diagnosed eating disorder. It could just mean it's some form of disordered eating. And that's where there's a big sort of gray area because we don't really know what's not normal. Right. And, um, again, we'll, we'll go through some of those, um, um, symptoms in terms of being able to um, identify whether your athlete would be in um, um, disordered eating and then again um, in the overall um, REDS um, scenario. So we're going to look at awareness, we're going to look at prevention, um, diagnosis and treatment. Really that comes from like obviously um, your support staff that you work with but it's from, I, I can't stress enough from a coach's perspective, it's really about being aware, being really aware, not saying that any of you are in um, Alberto's <laughs> kind of position. Um, I hope not. I think we're moving away from that, you know, body image. It's not, um, you know, all about leanness and, um, and, and thin, um, or even the drive to be, um, you know, muscular. It's getting away from some of those ideals and really about finding out what works best. What's that sweet spot of performance for your athletes, um, regardless of what weight or body image might, um, might be. So we're going to check in a little bit on um, on our own biases because we do have um, we we all come by nature with our own biases. Um, so being able to kind of check in with those um, will help um, you as coaches be better coaches, but also be able to recognize if if you may be having a slight influence in um, in, in some of those body image. Um, um, scenarios with your athletes. So talking about how we communicate the things that we say are very profound um, with athletes. And I should mention, you know, being in relative energy deficiency, we'll look at the definition in a second, but it really isn't all about maybe an intentional drive to be thin. I see it sort of 50-50 with athletes. Sometimes it's just an unintentional under eating um, by just not knowing how much energy some of these athletes need and what that translates into is a crap ton of food um, in order to support their overall daily physical processes, those enzymes and hormones to produce periods, to produce testosterone, to produce uh, bone, um, et cetera. That can be unintentional as well. So I just kind of wanted to preface that. Um, before we go. And so then we'll talk about kind of part two will be um, more on kind of what tools are available, assessment tools, and we're getting more and more as, um, as the research continues and the validation of some of these um, resources and tools become available. 
So what is relative energy, energy deficiency? This is a great YouTube video. I'm not going to show it today, but um, it just literally goes through what exactly REDS is. So if you're looking at something very quick to show with some of your athletes, that is um, a great video that was produced um, in Canada and um, is meant to be used um, with, with your athletes. So in a nutshell, it, it describes what it is. And when I do sessions with athletes, I always always mention how much energy do you need and then I look at all of what we say the effects of not getting enough energy are and I say if you see yourself in any one of those situations or what I call bubbles and I'll show you my bubble slide in a second then you need to talk to somebody because it's not normal to be um, to having some of those health and performance effects so what we look at in terms of energy requirements I love this so we have energy intake being um, what your actual um, intake is based on what your actual needs are. So week to week that changes with, with athletes. And so when we talk about nutri nutrition periodization, it really becomes important to be in tune with that because it is important to, to adjust not, not just the types of nutrients, but the amount of overall energy that that athlete is taking in from week to week. Okay. Um, so again, insufficient energy, you're looking at, um, that energy demand for training load is more, um, than actually what they're taking in. If we have equal, equal, um, matched energy intake with energy demand, you're in that sort of green zone, which is great. Um, and then again, if you are on, um, the other side where they actually have quite an intense, um, time in their, in their meso cycle or sort of their macro cycle, and they're actually having an excess of training load, um, and still that reduced energy, then that gap even becomes bigger. Um, and that's where we're seeing, um, quite a big difference. And we'll get, you know, there, there's been some sort of numbers thrown out in the research as to, you know, just how much are we talking about, Angela? Like, are we talking about like a missed snack a day for seven days? Um, it's been sort of equivocal in the research right now, but on average, it could mean just a difference of about 300 calories, which, yeah, is about the, what, an, uh, you know, an average snack would look like for an athlete or hopefully a missed 300 calories or a deficit of 300 calories for seven days plus. So if they're consistently, and then the effects become greater as the deficit becomes greater. So if they are consistently consuming a minimum deficit of 300 calories, they might start seeing some of um, our, um, our relative energy deficiency um, health effects. So energy consumed, so that's foods and fluids, minus the energy expended. So that's what we're looking at as, um, as the, the available energy for all the stuff that goes to health, which should be going to health first. So all your reproductive um, hormones, um, metabolic enzymes, your uh, um, bone gut, so your digestion, bone, cell maintenance, circulation, how we regulate body temperatures of your finding athletes are just not being able to um, warm up very um, efficiently and likewise cool down, um, again, could be um, an, a bit of an energy deficiency. Constantly getting sick, we'll talk about all the health effects and then all the performance effects um, that, that come from that or missed performance gains um, in all of those areas. So when we look at kind of the um, performance uh, or sorry, health risks of um, REDS, we're looking at immune function, athletes constantly getting sick. You heard the gal in the video, missed periods. So it doesn't have to mean that, I always say, I always ask my athletes, is it normal for an athlete to not get their menstrual cycle? And all the hands will go up and I won't, I could ask you, <laughs> do you think it's normal for an athlete not to get her period? Yeah, Christy's saying no right? So it might be common because of REDS. However, it's not normal. It shouldn't be normal. Okay. So whether it's um, oligomenorrhea, which is just sort of maybe longer um, periods between or times between periods. So longer than 35 days. Um, so I would say if you've got a wonky period, it kind of comes, it goes, it's not really regular, whatever that regular is for that athlete could be a bit of a red flag. If they're amenorrheic, which means three months without 
consecutive without a menstrual cycle, that's definitely a big red flag. Okay, so in part of our assessment, we'll, um, we always ask athletes as a screening tool um, how regular their menstrual cycles are. Outside of anything like um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, um, you know, that shouldn't be normal. Um, so the old female athlete tried, so I should, you know, we keep referring to females because of the menstrual cycle, but really all of this, and that's kind of where REDS was born out of, was the female athlete triad, which was simply an inefficient energy intake, so decreased energy availability, whether they had um, uh, an eating disorder or not, um, sort of a, 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 a decrease in bone um, mineral density. So again, maybe they have frequent fractures or just not recovering from fractures very easily. And then these kind of wonky menstrual cycles. So obviously it related to females because of the menstrual cycle, but then we were seeing you know, males that were consistently showing um, low energy availability, but having other symptoms as well or other health effects. So the female athlete tried hasn't kind of gone away. It still exists and you can still have a female athlete that just has those three conditions um, interrelated because they all affect each other. That's why they call it a triad um, without having all the other um, symptoms. But more and more we're seeing it's more of um, a, a multiple faceted um, uh, scenario. So I talked about immunity. So again, decreased um, immune uh, function, which happens naturally in intense training. It's even more impacted when you don't have um, proper gut health um, based on or from having um, regular um, sufficient intake. Gut intolerances, athletes that have told me multiple times, Angela, I used to be able to have this food, now I can't have this food. I just took it out of my diet, so now they have five foods that they eat. Not good, something's going on, other than if they do have a legit allergy or intolerance, which we would tease out in an assessment. Um, psychological, and so all of these arrows, sorry, there should be arrows that go from reds, the center of it all is the energy deficiency, causing all of these things except one bubble which is psychological that can actually drive again that reduced energy availability or reduced intake but it can also cause it too so it's a two-way two-way arrow there effects on cardiovascular disease growth and development we'll talk about the tanner stages in terms of adolescent um, growth and development and whether or not um, on that growth curve or that growth um, scale, whether your adolescent athletes aren't developing properly. Um, metabolically, again, um, different um, 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 metabolic functions that we look at in terms of decreasing their resting metabolic rate. So they may actually be striving to change body composition when in fact they're actually storing more body fat at that time and then they decrease more because they're not getting the results they want and they're driving that further and further away from what they're actually trying to do. So all in all, um, again, I, I, I wish I could print this and put it on our wall at CSEA because I think it's a really good reminder that if they're seeing any effects of these, um, it's really important to come talk to you, the coach, their IST, their doctor, their parent, um, whatever. So what effects does all of that have? So if you don't have health, you don't have performance. I always say that, it's right? It's like the icing on the cake. You gotta have the bare minimums met before you can actually start to see performance um, adaptations and, and training adaptations. So coaches are really great at, you know, kind of carving out a nice, perfect YTP, yearly training program and, um, you know, micro and meso cycles. And then if we're not seeing sort of adaptations, what do we do? we either look and see if they're either overtraining or overreaching and we either cut back and give them more rest and then ramp it up again. Right. I work with a lot of, um, sport, um, uh, psych, um, physiologists and that's exactly how they would manipulate their individual as a program. So if you're not seeing performance effects or advances, you're going to give them more sometimes when in fact that could actually be driving that deficit again, even more. 
Um, so if you're seeing decreased endurance performances, that cardiovascular piece, again, more injuries, um, whether it's minor, acute, um, or just chronic, um, the de decreased training response, they're just not quite there. They don't make a good call, especially in, in team sports. We see that decreased coordination. You might just chalk it up to, oh, the athlete was, um, Stress today, they had exams, but again, looking at if that's a, an, an ongoing thing. Um, decreased concentration, I love the next one, irritability. So I always get parents and athletes in my, my private clinic together. And when I, I bring up this, they say, oh, yeah, they have been pretty moody lately, but I just thought it was because, you know, they broke up with their boyfriend or girlfriend or had a fight with whoever, when in fact it is, potentially or could potentially be because they're just not having enough overall um, uh, energy to support training loads. Depression, again, um, that can come on very quickly and suddenly. So looking for signs of depression, obviously decreased glycogen stores are just running out of gas in the tank to perform um, a simple um, training task, decreased muscular strength um, as well. So kind of what we look for in terms of um, stress fractures or, or what we know from the literature um, based on um, kind of all of our different functions. So our endocrine, menstrual, obviously menstruation, um, metabolic, um, bone, and, and, um, and hematological um, uh, blood work we can get a sense that if we're not in the normal ranges of some of these things, we're actually going to have higher instances or higher uh, risk for, um, for stress fractures. You see it a lot in amenorrheic athletes. So athletes who are, um, who are um, amenorrheic, so that three month consecutive or plus, and I've had athletes say, I haven't had my period in, years. What really becomes tricky though is if they are taking an oral contraceptive, it kind of mimics um, or masks the actual results of those hormones, those female hormones. So harder to depict of, as to why they're actually not getting their period. Is it because of um, the oral contraceptive um, or is it because of the um, uh, REDS? Um, testosterone, again, normal ranges, um, you know, less risk um, if you're low testosterone. So great, um, great thing to have tested regularly with our athletes, not just males, but females as well. So what do we know right now and why is it a big deal? Um, I think if it continues to go unrecognized. Um, again, we think it's just a one time in the you know training period that an athlete just may be off and it just kind of gets brushed under. Um, again, some of it's unintentional. So just, you know, we have huge, we, we, I, I, I go to training camps, I see athletes, um, I know it's a challenge to get that amount of food required in, in the run of a day, especially when you're not in your own, um, in your own surroundings um, and you're dealing with maybe, um, you know, different cultures in terms of food and, and food availability. So, so it is, it, it can be unintentional for sure, but really we have a lack of awareness is kind of what um, the science is telling us and um, in, in, in terms of um, medical profession. So even doctors, sometimes I'll refer to um, a family doc, an athlete to a family doc, and I'll say, um, you know, relative energy deficiency or reds, and they'll say, well, what's that? Um, or they'll automatically say, oh, this athlete's fatigued, it's iron. Yeah, it could be iron, but it's probably not the root of, um, of the cause. Um, so in 2016, there was a survey done of tw uh, 20 international summer sport federations, or IFs, and they were all asked to rank um, their um, health-related topics. Um, and obviously, you know, health did rank one of the top, um, the health of the athlete ranked third after doping and safety, which is awesome because I do work with um, safe supplement use, um, but only 7%, so there was 28 federations, so that was like two out of 28, um, addressed REDS. So kind of tells us that 
um, A, they're not either seeing it or not recognizing it, maybe not even knowing what it actually is um, and, um, and, and how to go about um, um, addressing the, the, those situations or knowing how, how much of an impact that has on an athlete's health and performance. So what do we need for prevention? I, I think we have a long way to go in terms of um, prevention. Usually I see athletes who are already in it or who have been in it. Um, tell you, I'm, I'm always full of stories, but it kind of relates it back to practical. I had an athlete, um, she was a, a female soccer player and she, um, at the age of 14, wasn't growing, wasn't growing, um, had multiple fractures, um, didn't really think anything of it. Um, again, that was, you know, four years ago, she's 18 now, um, went undiagnosed, really wasn't, again, a, a well-known um, thing, and kept playing sport, and then by 18, um, had to be literally taken out of the sport for a year in order for um, those injuries to heal, um, and was actually referred to me from her doctor who said, I think this athlete has reds, can you do an assessment? Um, and the mother and athlete came into my clinic and the, and the mother felt so bad because in, in this case, it was, I think a bit of unintentional, um, um, deficiency at first. And then it became to, oh, my body's changing. How do I deal with that? Um, you know, and the first instinct is to reduce or restrict maybe intake. So then she had a double whammy. Um, again, so, and that can take years to come out of, um, some of those behaviors because really it is about changing, um, eating behaviors and attitudes towards, um, eating and food, whether it is a body image, um, uh, thing or not. So prevention strategy should really include athletes and coaches. So I always, um, ask the permission, um, Obviously not in the, the, the situation of the video at first might not have been a good um, opportunity there to involve the coach. So you have to kind of tease out what is the, 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 the kind of root cause going on here that's causing the reds. Um, but important to, um, to, to ask permission if it's okay to, um, to, to let the coach know so that they can adjust their overall, um, overall uh, training because it's not all about just getting more in, because that's going to take a lot of time. I always say if they just get one extra, you know, piece of bread in a day or one extra egg in a day, that could take months. Um, again, breaking those learned behaviors. So it's about narrowing that deficiency or narrowing that gap. And if we have to do that by decreasing training, um, and again, to obviously help um, in terms of reducing some of those health effects and risks, we can inch the intake up while that kind of expenditure is becoming a, a little less. Um, so we're kind of, again, narrowing the deficiency, um, while working on getting, um, extra in extra food or extra energy in. We need to be gender specific. So I think, again, um, based from the female athlete try getting into reds, um, we have a lot of literature around um, female athletes. I have a slide to show you we're getting more in males. And I just had a coach email me. I was so happy the other day. And he said, you send me the, the, the leaf cue. So if anyone has any experience with the low energy availability, L-E-A-F, female, <laughs> low energy availability in females questionnaire otherwise known as a leaf cue, he said, is there anything for males? And I said, it's coming. So we do have a researcher out of Australia who is actually working on validating um, a low energy availability questionnaire for males. So hang tight. If you have males that you suspect, and I, I, I do see males with it as well, um, that we will have um, an assessment tool for them coming. Um, it involves changes in sport regulation and policy and healthcare system. I think we just need to educate, educate um, that this is very prominent in multiple different sports. It's not just in athletics. It's not just in our um, aesthetic sports, what are, you know, sort of those um, judged um, body uh, image type sports. Um, we're seeing it across all types of sports. So, um, Yes, include, again, it's going to take a while to change behaviors, um, and it's going to involve maybe changes in some sport organization policies. So we need to really work from, you know, an, an NSO or PSO level to say, if we have athletes who are assessed 
by you know our IST, by um, healthcare professionals in REDS, this is what needs to happen. Um, I haven't seen that yet. I'm driving it um, when I do have um, specific situations to help the coaches um, deal with why we are scaling back training, why we need to have um, you know an, an actual um, strategic approach to how we get the that athlete back to training or back to play. So there's lots of um, eating disorder questionnaires out there. Um, if you're interested, um, feel free to connect with me offline. Usually I don't just give them to coaches and say, hey, you know, go ahead and, and uh, facilitate this within your, um, within your training groups. But it might be something to kind of look at and look for maybe some of these signs of um, whether your athletes are doing extra exercise, so they're compulsive exercisers, um, being aware of kind of um, body signals, um, whether they have a positive um, attitude towards healthy exercise, or whether they're overly concerned with weight um, and shape. Um, so, you know, having some of those kind of, um, I guess, questionnaires in the back of your your, your tickle trunk or your toolbox um, is a well worth um, well worth view. So connect with me if you're interested. Other identification and screening tools. Um, obviously, we're looking at best um, uh, outcome or best outcomes would be early detection. So we're trying to get all of our um, most of our uh, groups that we work with on an annual sort of screening. So whether it's um, you know an annual um, assessment that you do at intake with athletes, that will actually um, give us some quality, some objective um, data that we can actually work with the athlete on as almost like a um, again more of a strategic approach to teasing out maybe something else that might be happening um, health-wise versus something that, um, that that's leading us to, um, uh, to uh, a REDS diagnosis. Um, so the screening tool I mentioned, the LEAF and the Lean Q, hopefully coming soon. We do have um, what we call relative energy deficiency in uh, sport what I call CAT or the clinical assessment tool. Um, it's still, it still is requiring validation, but it is the only real piece of um, an assessment tool that we have. So I've used that in the past with um, both athletes and coaches to, to work with um, in, in conjunction with the LEAF Q if, if we're dealing with females. And then we've got some new screening tools coming out on just sort of the eating overall um, eating behavior and psychopathology with athletes and teasing out again that whether or not we're dealing with an eating disorder, which still could be part of um, relative energy deficiency or whether we're dealing with um, some forms of disordered, disordered eating, which becomes really muddy because they kind of move through. And we'll, I'll look at in a second of a slide called the continuum of um, disordered eating because you know, one day they might see great, seem great, and then the next day they might be further on the on the negative side of that of that continuum. So lots of um, new emerging uh, research. So I just wanted to throw out a, a few in terms of screening tools um, in reference to um, eating psychopathology. And again, I wouldn't expect coaches to kind of just go ahead and, and implement some of these screening tools, but hopefully you have um, a good IST that you can work with, or you've got um, you know, um, a mental performance consultant that can help with maybe a dietitian and, um, and, and help um, in that assessment or that regular screening um, with your with your athletes so um, again what we kind of look for is a complete history of signs and symptoms that's something I would go through with the athlete it's something you can go through with an athlete um, I know I've had coaches ask me before Angela do you have just a list of um, blood work that I can ask all my athletes to get done Totally. That is something I would totally encourage if you're interested. I can give you the list and you'll see some of them here listed in the next few slides. You can write them down. Um, some of the things I would, I would uh, obviously get a full history of menstruation. So um, ask when they started their, if they're female, asking when they started um, their menstrual cycles. If they haven't started by the age of 15, it's a little bit of a red flag, not to say that it's you know, do or die. They're definitely in reds if they're 16 and haven't had their period yet. Um, but definitely something to, um, to be on the lookout for. Again, 
irregular cycles, three consecutive months lost, bone um, or stress fractures. So again, not a lot of us are privy to getting bone mineral density scans done with a DEXA. I wish we were. I wish that could be part of a general screen. Um, unfortunately, it isn't. But if you suspect, you know, an ongoing or chronic um, fracture injury, then I would recommend um, referral to doc to get a, a, um, a bone density done. Again, immunity. So some of the other physical things, we look for um, the BMI. Again, don't really use it for anything else <laughs> in terms of sport because muscularity of athletes. Um, but if we're definitely seeing a BMI of under 17.5, uh, then it's a bit of, a, again, a, a risk indicator. If they've lost weight. So I actually had a coach contact me last week and said, Angela, I think I, I'm suspecting reds. And I'm like, great not great, but great that you're, you know, real, uh, recognizing that. And he said, what can I do? He said, she's had a, um, an extreme weight loss over the last, you know, month, two months, um, unexplained or to me, it's unexplained. Um, so we actually ran through the, um, the, the leaf cue with this athlete and now it's going to cause further, uh, more and further discussion or diagnosis. But, um, Tanner stage, as I mentioned, so again, that sort of um, process, the regular development process with, um, with, with male and female um, adolescents. Other physical signs, functional um, hypothalamic amenorrhea. So again, excluding anything other clinical uh, reasons why um, an athlete might not be getting their period. Um, and then again, if they aren't, then um, if, if that's out, ruled out, then we would um, um, determine that it would potentially be caused by energy deficiency. Um, not a lot of us take blood pressures, but I have a lot of athletes say I get really dizzy, I've passed out, I've had an athlete at actually at, um, at Pan Am Games who was suffering from, and it wasn't hot, it wasn't humid, definitely not dehydrated, definitely not, not low sodium, um, and potentially um, having a low, um, a low blood pressure um, could be another um, indication that um, uh, have, they have a, a deficiency. Fasting blood glucose, so this is some of the, the, the um, biochemistry that I would run on an athlete or ask for. I wish I lived to see the day dietitians can order blood work, but right now we can't. So we have to go through either the sport doc um, or um, their, their family um, doctor. And a lot, not a lot of them, if they don't understand REDS, will ask, why am I doing all this? A, it costs money. B, again, they don't understand. So if they don't understand what REDS is, they're not going to warrant um, a, a lot of this blood work. So if you have a good connection with the doc, um, it really helps. Um, so fasting blood glucose, again, low glycogen stores, if they're having um, a low... Um, a low fasting blood glucose, um, low ferritin, so iron does um, play a part as well. Vitamin D, um, that should just should be a general screen that we should be doing annually on our athletes anyway, um, because we know all the benefits of um, bone and muscle um, with vitamin D. Um, endocrine function, so for females looking at um, luteinizing hormone, FSH, estradiol, um, free TH, so um, that again would be for males as well. Um, LDL, so those, you know, the, the bad cholesterol um, actually becomes elevated um, in, um, in, a, in, in a red situation. Um, fasting insulin, insulin like growth factor, and then the big one at the bottom, um, which I find a bit challenging to get, but it's kind of our our golden, I guess, um, rule of, of diagnosis. Um, if we have an athlete who has a resting metabolic rate, so how do we get resting metabolic rates? Morgan is my intern. She's on the, on the, on the call. Um, she knows it's not easy as an estimated energy um, requirement equation that we normally work with. If we have access to hook them up to a metabolic cart or have a DEXA um, done on an athlete, then we're going to get a truer picture of what that resting metabolic rate is. But that gets a little muddied as well because in training, that resting metabolic rate, we can increase it, right? Different types of training, we can work to increase resting metabolic rate. And definitely in, um, in reds, we see a decrease in that. 
So getting multiple um, data on how to where that athlete is in amongst their YTP will give us a better average of what their resting metabolic rate is. And we just we just don't do that. It's not it's not practical. Um, Again, bone mineral density, um, if we have the um, availability to get that done, if they have a low bone mineral density, would be our other laboratory assessment. So we, we're, we are getting some new research in males and what we need to um, look for in assessment as well. Obviously, um, metabolic hormones would play in, um, your bone mineral density, um, frequency of injuries, but also looking at testosterone levels. So again, BMI would still be um, an, an, an adequate marker as well. Um, but again, getting a bit more information in terms of um, reproductive hormones as well with uh, with males. But again, it's getting that getting that blood work done and being able to ver um, justify um, why we want all this blood work done. So, which is what I'm finding quite quite challenging to get and then get retested, right? So then you're working with an athlete, bringing them back to play or back to training. And you want to get those markers as part of that, again, structured kind of um, protocol and getting them out of reds. You kind of need that ongoing three to four months kind of um, revision of the or repeat blood work done. So how do we assess energy availability in terms of what are we actually talking about? How much energy are we talking about? I know I kind of mentioned calories being like about 300 calories, um, but um, it really depends on what their, um, what their overall estimated energy um, expenditure is. So if we can get a better estimation, and we get a lot of athletes that wear the polars, or they do, I know some athletes are wearing whoop and kind of estimating what their overall energy um, demand is of their training, that's great. We have estimated um, metabolic equivalents that we work with as well to better estimate exactly what they're burning in each of their training um, periods and if their intake is um it's it's their intake divided by um or minus sorry that energy expenditure divided by their fat-free mass so how do we get fat-free mass great if you've got a dexa scan and you know you can get that body fat percentage then the rest would be fat-free mass considerably right or you're doing body composition assessments, so the skin folds, which is what some of our physiologists and myself do with athletes. If you've got an athlete that you suspect might have an eating disorder or disordered eating, you're probably not going to be doing body composition assessments. <laughs> so you're probably not going to have that fat-free mass, kilo weight to be able to say, definitely this athlete is in reds because they are below, so the cutoff is below 30 kilocals per fat-free mass. You can pretty much tell, I had an athlete um, who was a weight category athlete, was constantly having to make weight every two weeks. Her regular sitting body weight was 62 kilos. Her fighting weight was 57 kilos. So what would that automatically tell you? <laughs> She's probably in reds consistently. She's having to make weight every two weeks. She's up and down. She's very rarely sitting at 62 because she's was making, trying to make weight every two weeks. Naturally, you'd want to go up in weight class, right? However, the opponents in that weight class were a lot taller. She wouldn't have as much advantage over regaining some of that um, some of that weight to help fight the leaner, lighter, smaller opponents in that lower weight category. So her intake was 1,250 calories on a good day without kind of that weight cutting three, four days before. I don't know if any coaches are in any weight category sports or weight cutting sports, um, but her intake was 1,250 calories a day. Good day on average, probably more like around 1,000 calories a day. When I did her energy expenditure, she was at 3,200 calories. So I didn't even, I had body composition assessments on her from a, a, a history of them over three years. And her body fat was continuously going up. So she kept decreasing her intake because she wasn't getting the desired result. She wasn't losing weight. 
I didn't really need to have the fat free mass to know that she was probably well under that 30 kilocals per fat free mass just based on knowing she was a third of her intake of her needs. So it's a good um, um, kind of parameter to use, but in practicality, we usually don't have that fat free mass to, um, to clinically say that they are below that 30 kilocals per fat free mass. But if you suspect that kind of big difference, then, um, that, then they probably are well. And she, when I actually did her, um, her energy availability, um, which is again, energy availability, we look at about 45 kilocals per kilogram of fat free mass as being an energy availability or where athletes should be. She was at 12. So I am hoping that this COVID crisis has actually <laughs> enabled her to come out of that a little bit because we never had the opportunity to actually stop training. And as part of an IST, which we'll kind of get to in a sec, is we actually need that, again, those policies, those um, sport poli policies to help us when we are in that situation. I've. It's not just... The dietitian's voice or the coach's voice it's a collective voice to say if we see and we know we have all the clinical assessments done if they are in reds they need to stop training and that's really what should have happened but given she still had six other qualifying matches to uh to to compete in in order to make the olympics it was a hard sell so um i talked about relative energy or sorry um the uh, resting metabolic rate of what can kind of happen. So obviously the more, at, more hours in or the longer the deficit is, um, it, the, the athlete is in deficit for, the lower the estrogen, the higher the cortisol, the lower that resting metabolic rate will be. So I'm not gonna, again, I talked about, about this in, it, in, um, in, in the bubble sheets um, a bit, but um, obviously, you know, the crutch of it all is, you know, if we're looking at food and body and kind of that increased preoccupation, if you're seeing things like um, they're adopting specific diets, and I have a great slide, we probably won't get to it in this part one, but Morgan will touch on it um, on the next part two is um, what we call um, ortho, uh, orthorexia, which is an over obsession with um, healthy foods. So I, whenever I have athletes in a session, I say, what's your favorite food? Like, just off the top, you know, as an icebreaker. And if somebody says spinach, that should be a red flag. I mean, I love salads too, but probably not my, my ultimate favorite food. So if they're 100% focused on healthy, organic, whatever it is, they're, you know, eliminating, you know, certain foods or food groups or labeling certain foods, good, bad, that's totally unhealthy or, you know, that again could be um, a preoccupation um, and um, and and a um, a risk for um, under eating. I mentioned some of the challenges. So obviously, sport body types. You saw that in the video. Um, coaches' beliefs and experiences, and changing maybe some of our own again biases. Um, good athlete traits. Oh, Ten years ago, we were trying to get an athlete at a percent body fat at 9% because gold medal profiling tells us that world champ is at da da da. Um, and this athlete performed when two world champs with a 2% higher body fat than the previous. Um, so we tend to do that data analysis. And we've got lots of good IST that, that, that do that, the number crunching for us when really it doesn't take into account that individual variability with, with, with athletes. Um, so success and performance, looking at, again, trends, if we can collect data on, on that one athlete and find that sweet spot of what that perfect percent body fat is or what that perfect body composition is within that athlete, um, then that's what, we, that's what we should be striving for. Um, okay, I'm going to move. How am I doing for time, Christy? I'm at three o'clock already. Oh my gosh, this is such a good topic, but... <laughs> Yeah, no, take you take take it to where you think like the part one would end and and then we can just have a few questions there and then we'll continue part two whenever uh, 
you're more okay. level. So yeah, keep going. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll finish just a bit on that kind of disordered eating, um, not really getting in too much into actual eating disorders. It's a whole other topic. Um, I could spend another you know, hour just talking about clinical assessment of eating disorders. So if you're interested, again, feel free to connect with me. I've got lots of good literature on that. I love this slide because I see athletes within their whole year um, sliding back and forth so disordered eating in that middle range would be that rigid kind of eating or binge eating. Right now I say we're all in stress, so a little bit of binge eating might be um, a necessity um, and normal at this point without having the, again, obsession with um, the performance piece. Um, good or bad determining, you see them kind of um, experimenting with different diets, over obsession with body um, composition um, and shape or dissatisfaction with body um, and then getting into the normal, they're okay with how their body looks. They're pretty safe in their own skin. They feel pretty confident, um, comfortable with foods. They could have the cookie and not feel like they need to run another um, you know, 5K. <clears throat> On the other side, um, again, uh, really their, their thoughts are overly consumed with uh, weight, shape, and food um, at all, all times of the day. Um, lots of information on kind of males and females we know have eating disorders, so it's not excluding males at all. And I usually I see it in males because they're the, the drive to gain lean muscle mass. I have a lot of hockey um, athletes in my private practice actually who um, I've seen in reds um, because it's the fear of gaining unwanted fat or weight, so they restrict. Um, again, eating disorders, um, I think I'll kind of stop maybe there because um, I know Morgan's going to take on the next sort of few slides in terms of um, talking about orthorexia and a little bit on, um, on um, bulimia and, and anorexia. So I'll open it up right now to any questions. The second part, we actually get into um, a little bit more of what those resources and tools are and how do we go about getting athletes out of reds first off and to um, what that getting uh, return to play would look like. Okay, great. Thanks, Angela. And yeah, yeah. if anyone, oh, can you send us a slide presentation? So we will record, we've been recording this whole session, so it will be posted on YouTube and you can go through it that way. Um, or Angela, if you want to send the slides out, like how, yeah, what I might do is I'll, I'll cut it off at the first, uh, the first half and then in part two. So I'll definitely send it the first half because um, the second half won't make a whole lot of sense unless, <laughs> unless you're here. Um, and then if they want to record the second, they want to watch the, the second recording and then I'll send it the second slides uh, after the second session for sure. Yep. Sure. Awesome. So yeah, if, if you do want the slides, maybe just private message me your email address. I know I have uh, most of the Nova Scotian coaches, but if you are from out of province, I might not have your email. So just send me a private message and we'll get those slides to you. I didn't see any of the chat, so hopefully there wasn't. Oh, can't have video. Okay. <laughs> just out of curiosity, um, has, has anyone, does anyone think they've had an athlete in reds or have worked with um, maybe a sport dietitian before knowingly that an athlete has been in reds or now think, wow, I probably do have <laughs> some. I see some nods. Hi, it's Teresa from Ontario. Um, I actually think I had a kid might've been like that. She, um, just kept feeling faint all the time and was fainting at home. And I'm like, well, there's something going on for sure. We thought it was, you know, low iron. So I had her go to the doctors and get some blood work done. And, and uh, you know, like they did a lot of testing with her heart and stuff too. Like, cause we just didn't know what it was, where she was at. And I'm like, so what's your eating like? And she would skip breakfast and she was cutting down food. Like she wasn't, fat but exact she wasn't exactly um ripped either so i think she wanted to get more towards that and i'm just like dude i i, I think we need to you know address your eating just because i don't think you're getting enough energy and uh 
we actually had a nutritionist and, and they, all my athletes actually were like, can we get a nutritionist in? And I'm like, oh my God, I'm so glad you asked. So I actually had a nutritionist come in and really open their eyes and she still doesn't like breakfast, but I'm like, you need it. Like you have a lot more activities than just tumbling. You need to keep on top of your food so that you have the energy to perform, let alone just, you know, stay not dizzy. So, um, so I think she's made some changes now. I haven't seen her in a while, but actually this uh, thing has now made me want to connect with her and say, Hey, how's it going? Are you eating breakfast anymore still? So, um, because, um, and I might have other athletes that are kind of in the situation too, because like, and, and they just like, I never say, Oh, you guys are getting fat or anything. I always talk about fitness and being strong mm -hmm. and being flexible and good fitness, good fitness. But I never talk about weight or body image. I myself was a gymnast and I know my coaches used to weigh me. And I remember one day, oh, I dropped down to 109 pounds. All right, they must be really happy with me. And I couldn't get a giant over that day at all. And I'm like, I'm freaking too tired. I can't do this. I don't care if I weigh more. I need more energy. I need the power to get over the bar in a giant. So I'm like, I don't care if my pound's up. I learned on my own that being yeah. skinny isn't the way to go. It's like you need the food to get you the energy that you need to do what you want to do. So for me, it's not about um, what the body looks like. It's about how well the body functions. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> I know Chris said, I do. Nick said, definitely. Yeah. Some kind of aha moments maybe there of maybe suspect. And you know what? I, I feel for coaches, like the coach that the, the, one of the national coaches that uh, emailed me like last week and said, Oh, like, I don't know what to do with this. Right. Like, could be disordered eating, could be an disorder, and I don't, I don't want to touch that, so I'll leave it to you. Um, and that's okay, because it's uncomfortable, right? We don't know what the root issues or reasons are, and usually if it's an eating disorder, there are other underlying causes other than sport, or usually, um, and that's not our wheelhouse. So it's okay to be uncomfortable, um, but uh, we, I, I, I see it more happen um, as a, uh-oh, like it's a surprise. So we've kind of sensed some things going on, swept it under the rug and then went, oh crap. Now the athletes, what I say, broken. So depression sets in, they're just, they've, they need a break. And to take a break and have the coach tell them they need to take a break is a huge, huge hurdle to overcome with both coaches and athletes to, to be able to have that in order for them to be able to get healthy, get unbroken. So, so hopefully I'll see you all in part two. Hopefully I teased you enough with the information. <laughs> oh, another question. I was going to ask you if you've seen any male hockey players in reds. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. It's actually becoming more and more, and younger. I've had a, an athlete who was, I think, 13 um, and a goalie, very lean, very, very, very lean. And for two years, I've been working with him. So he's probably, what, 15 now. Um, and he actually um, was tested for celiac disease. So I was kind of curious at first whether it was just like GI stuff related to the reds, but then um, he actually developed Crohn's disease. So that coupled with kind of the disordered eating kind of thoughts, just the fear of fat for him was crazy. This was a guy that I actually said, what's your favorite food? And he said, ice cream. I said, how, how often do you have it? He says, never. I said, why? Like you're a kid, right? Like be a kid. It's okay. Even dietitians have ice cream and chocolate too. <laughs> All right, great. Um... Just checking these group chats. Okay, yeah. So a lot of people seem to think that some of their previous athletes probably had reds. They just weren't aware of it. Yeah. Um, so if you guys do have any more questions or if you do want the slides, I'm just going to put my email in the chat box. So that might be the easiest way to reach me. And then I can connect you with Angela for those slides. Um, and t stay tuned for part two. We'll probably yeah. do it um, either next week or the week after. I'll have to look at the schedule. Um, but we have lots of sessions prepared for as long as the isolation period uh, keeps up. So our next session is on Tuesday. Um, so you can check out our website for more information, csca.atlantic.ca, and everything is also in the locker too if you want to check out our schedule there. 
but thank you so much for tuning in this afternoon and thank you Angela for this very informative uh, presentation. I know this is a new top, newer topic uh, in terms of nutrition so definitely lots of information that coaches can learn a lot from. So uh, if you want much. if you want access to those resources please email me and we can get that to you. Awesome guys hope to see you uh, in part two and uh, Thanks, Teresa, for your comments and everybody for your comments. Thanks, Teresa, for tuning in from Ontario. It's great. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.